about uh, the different marketing trend in uh, 2022. Uh, and we have an amazing panel here with us today. Uh, so I think we should start with some introductions. Um, maybe I can start. Uh, I'm the CEO of Umami Games, and we make hyper casual mobile games. And um, uh, we've been working with publishers for around two years, and now we're looking into self-publishing. So it's been a long road of building back-end tools and uh, getting ready for that. Uh, in my screen, Manu, you're the, uh, you're the first one, so maybe you can start introduction, introducing yourself. Sure. Thank you, Riley. Yeah, I'm, I'm Manu Gambier. I am a CEO co-founder of Snapper, which is a new engagement marketing platform for mobile games. I've been in the games industry for my whole life. Um, I've built and sold a handful of companies in this space, active investor in the field. Uh, everything from real money, uh, casino, poker, sports betting, social games, mobile games. And uh, these days, uh, more recently, kind of play to earn and NFT gaming. Uh, also have recently invested in a uh, upmarket physical venue for sports bettors here in the U.S., uh, I'm a partner in the largest gaming company in India. It's called Games 24 7. Um, and throughout this entire journey, uh, game marketing, especially engagement and retention marketing, has been my, my core passion. Um, so, very excited to be here. Thank you. That sounds very interesting and definitely like you have the right background for being in the panel. Uh, so we look forward to hearing more of that. What about you, Anurag? Can you tell a little bit more about yourself and your background? Sure. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so my name is Anurag. I work as a customer success manager with Tenjin. Uh, Tenjin is a marketing analyt analytics and an attribution provider for mobile game developers. So our niche is mostly with hyper-casual games. So we essentially help developers uh, understand which of the campaigns are performing really well, uh, You know which campaigns are giving them the best ROI, LTV, ROAS. Um, so I work with a lot of customers on a daily basis, trying to understand, you know, how they can really uh, grow their apps, uh, how they can really use the potential of engine to the fullest. Um, and I'm also like looking at uh, working with newer customers, newer developers out of uh, newer markets such as India and Southeast Asia. So yeah, great to be here. very interesting and uh, a bit of another feel. So I think that's a good combination. How about you, Chloe? I am. I'm good to be here and um, share with you all. Um, I'm sure Tanish here at NIST, um, and really, really excited to be here. Sounds super good and very interesting. What about you, Pao? Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Pao. Uh, I'm from Spain. I live in Germany. I am the GM of user acquisition here at Fiverr. We are a monetization platform. Pretty, it's, it's pretty known, I, I guess, for the audience. And we have an exchange, marketplace, and offer wall. Now we're part of DT. DT Turban is the company that actually bought us at Colony and Appreciate. So we came together and we're building a large a platform for, for app development. And yeah, for use acquisition and monetization. My job is basically, I am a blend between product and market. And I help mostly gaming companies to grow, either to monetize more or to get more users in order to make more money. And that's what I'm here for. I my background is gaming. Actually, I I was working gaming in gaming different gaming companies, mostly midcore, hardcore, and casual gaming, and that's my background. Yeah, sounds super interesting. Is it a one up? I see in the in the background. Uh, you have like a Mario. Uh... It's a Mario. Yeah, I'm a big <laughs> Nintendo fan. Yeah, that's so good. Okay, great guys. Sounds like we have a good mix of attribution and. Um and uh, advertisers and developers and also uh, yeah the whole monetization side um, and um, when talking about that at least for me as a developer as well I feel like uh, 2021 uh, what a year huh uh, with the whole changes with IDFA and um, at least for me as a developer that kind of changed the way we work so my first question was did it change the way you guys work I'm not sure whether maybe an Iraq uh, you could start. I imagine uh, being attribution uh, service, uh, it must have affected you somehow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so last year was definitely uh, different and challenging for all of us uh, with IDFA going away. Um, so at Engine, we sort of like started building on some new cool stuff around the privacy centric model uh, around SCAD network. So uh, what we are trying to do now also is trying to build more on the SCAD network features and tools. 
so that customers can understand this new ecosystem much better. Uh, obviously, like last year was new to a lot of developers, so obviously the adoption rate for SCAD network wasn't as much. But the idea for us was to help these customers through uh, through giving them the flexibility of you know uh, they can use a SCAD network they, they, the way they want. So um, like unlike a lot of other uh, uh, MPs, what we do is we give them the flexibility to like use conversion values the way they really want to use it. So this gives them the opportunity to like experiment and test SCAD network so that they can eventually start optimizing SCAD network better. So, so that's obviously one area where we uh, uh, have been focusing more because of these changes. Um, and also we've uh, like looked at marketing automation as, as an opportunity uh, where we've also launched a uh, growth full stack as our ETL service, which uh, helps people, uh, you know, collect all of this data and sort of analyze all of this data in a, and store it in a data warehouse of their choice. So uh, so all of these uh, tools and services that we are really working on every day is because of these changes that have happened, right? Um, so the hope is that eventually uh, all developers, indie developers, small studios really understand this change is probably going to be uh, for the long term and really pick it up uh, and become more comfortable with it. Yeah. That will, I mean, helping develop it, that's uh, amazing. I know at Umami Games, we actually use part of your growth full stack without it being some kind of commercial ad for Tintin. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's some very cool tools. What about you, Powered Fiber? Uh, how did that affect you? Well, from the, since I work in UA and Admon, I'll try to cover both real quick. Mm -hmm. So on the monetization side of things, it's been quite a ride because uh, as you can imagine, the CPNs were affected on the iOS piece. Mm -hmm. So we had to actually educate ourselves and help our publishers to actually develop new strategies and waterfall compositions and things like that in order to maximize the the, the revenue. You know? Because uh, as we all know, there was a dip in the CPMs on iOS, and that has been driving a lot of discussions around. So yeah, that would be on the monetization side of things, a complete new paradigm, which we actually had to had to uh, understand. On the UA side of things, on the other hand, DT is very strong on Android. We work on on-device tech, apart from the DSP programmatic, where we work also on iOS, but the on-device is mostly on Android. So from that side, what we've also seen is that a lot of advertisers have actually shifted budgets from iOS to Android, given the new scenario, and that actually benefited us. And since we're not a self-attributed network, we also were able to keep business well, for iOS as well, so we are able to cater both. But the the circumstances on the iOS piece actually benefited companies like us, which are mostly focused on Android. Yeah, that's some very interesting perspectives because you hear a lot of the how it has affected people negatively, but also hearing some positives is uh, is very good. Uh, what about you, Chloe at AppMix? Has it affected uh, the, the way you guys work? Well, it's quite the opposite, actually, because it, it kind of like gave us more opportunities um, because and my background is very performance focused and, and programmatic focused. So like in the sense that's very data focused. Um, but here at Mix, we want to drive like more non-intrusive brand awareness ads within games. And it gave us more opportunity to speak to gaming developers hey, you know, you've got brand advertisers, they really, really want to target your gaming audiences. Um, you know, you, you probably are going to lose like, advertising revenue because of IDFA, uh, the situation. Why not, you know, try this new monetization solution and it's going to be incremental revenue. You don't need to change uh, anything uh, in terms of your monetization stack anyway. So from our perspective, uh, it actually, you know, opened a lot of doors for us. Uh, so we were quite not pleased with the situation, but we were pleased with, like, you know, some new changes. And we also saw this uh, similar trend as uh, Pauso, uh as well. Like uh, we definitely um, saw uh, advertisers move their, especially UA advertisers move their budget uh, from iOS to Android, just because there's still data available there. Uh, but then we also saw a lot of brand advertisers you know, invested more um, in iOS as well. So, yeah, in a nutshell, all good. <laughs> Love changes. <laughs> very, very interesting. How, yeah, how it created new opportunities, right? Uh, what about you, Manuel? At, at, at Snapur, is, is it, um, has it affected you guys in any way? Well, actually, Snapper was partly born as a company because of this shift, right? So, 
uh, as there's more privacy uh, related features being offered to consumers, yeah, our thinking has been that there's going to be a greater investment in uh, player retention and engagement. It's, it's always been an underinvested area. Um, and so, you know, with, with the IDFA changes, of course, it's going to have some impact on CPI and LTV. It's going to vary across game genres. I, mean, I think for this particular game genre of, of hyper casual, what I've seen is the impact has generally been less because there's not a need to do as much targeting. Uh, you know, it's more of a mass market appeal. Uh, but but there has been you know some impact there as well. Um, and on the monetization side, uh, you know, with the LTV, I think there's also some risk from uh, companies we work with, our own games. Uh, we have seen uh, some impact there, more on mid-core side and less on the uh, hyper-casual side. But tactically, I think there's lots of techniques we're seeing that people are employing to mitigate the impact of IDFA, um, all kinds of ways to increase opt-in and, um, you know, uh, use better data science to kind of predict uh, what the, uh, the better targeting of the users. Uh, but our, our thinking has been, you know, how can we look at this more strategically overall? If you look at the overall marketing budget, um, the most underinvested area remains just tapping those users who are churning out or, or new users who aren't converting, uh, you know, by day seven. I mean, I think we all know um, 90 plus percent of the users aren't there by day seven that's a gold mine, right? And so Snapper was built to really help this genre of games go target uh, that particular audience and, and monetize them. Very interesting. And I think also being a game developer, uh, I mean, making even better game experiences, retaining players longer, that's, uh, that, that sounds very great. Uh, and I can also say for our that we also changed our budgets from iOS to Android. So it definitely seems to be a trend. Um, now, Anurag, you already started talking a little bit about it, but I wanted to chat a little bit about, have you guys, are you working on any tools or any projects uh, due to this whole new situation that uh, will make life easier uh, for the ecosystem? Uh, I don't know, Manu, do you guys make any tools or products like that? Uh, we'll start yeah. the other one around. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I mean, that's, that's exactly what Snapper is. It's a platform for creating player engagement. Um, I have a, a solo speech right after this where I demo the platform for anyone who might be interested in actually seeing how it works. Of course, you can uh, see it on our site as well. Um, you know, but, but the challenge that we saw really was that everybody sort of knows that engagement is important and you, know, you have to uh, improve your retention. But the challenge becomes that how do you actually implement these campaigns, right? It, it takes time. Often the marketers end up going to the developers who code up these campaigns and the time to market to build these things was pretty slow. Um, and so we had this idea a while back um, that how could we build kind of a, a programming language effectively for marketers, the world's first ever programming, but it's a, a completely visual drag and drop, but nevertheless, a, a real language. Um, that technology we used a few years ago in our own company, Games 24-7, um, and Games 24-7 is a substantial uh, venture. We have about uh, 700 employees in India. Um, we, we ended up implementing this and we grew our lifetime value by 50% from an already very large, you know, multi-hundred million dollar revenue base. Um, and so that just opened our eyes that, look, this, this is an area we need to invest more in. And if we can build tools that we can bring to the rest of the industry, uh, that, that really should be kind of a winning combination. That sounds very impressive. Uh, I might join that talk later uh, to hear more. Be great. <laughs> what about you, Chloe, at, at Atmix? Um, would you say there's any specific things you're doing uh, due to the whole situation? Um, because our focus is being like non-intrusive uh, user experience, so we have been focusing on like you know before 2021, and we actually have got more like hypercasual studios on board because of the the, the changes. Uh, because like Manu uh, mentioned about the retention rate, um, and rightly, I'm. 
I'm sure that you know it like so well because you're so data driven, like from day three. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's always a challenge. Um, so you want to monetize like as much as possible in the first three days, right? But then you also don't want to upset your players. So here, here I make the the uh, in-game billboards are actually perfect because they are just in the game and players don't need to stop. They just need to play their games and you're taking no game uh, play time away. So it had been our focus and it's definitely been our focus. We haven't done any changes and in terms of the, the focus, but we definitely, there is a lot of like different progressions and we are going to, however, we're talking about data here. We're, we're actually going to, launch our um, click feature um, this, this year as well, because that's what advertisers want. Um, and that's something we just need to, you know, be more data driven. Yeah, that's what we're doing right now. Very interesting. Yeah, I know we talked about it before, Chloe, uh, where in Hypercasual you have a tendency to have to make logos and stuff like that, right? For different items where we talked about if I could just get them and actually make money from having them instead of using time and resources on making them. It, Seems like a smart fit, right? Uh, what about yeah. a driver? Uh, is there any specific uh, things we can expect from you guys uh, this year? Yeah, well, um, you know, there's this this thing that for given this new problem with data, let's call it problem, no, the mm -hmm. whole paradigm that we have with IDFA is that it becomes more and more important that it's actually uh, uh, cheaper to reacquire a user than to acquire a new one, right? And that basic is. That logic is there. So cross promotion, we are seeing that is a big topic that comes around all the all kinds of developers, but specifically the big ones that I can actually build this content fortress, can build these walled gardens. So pr cross promotion, we believe is going to be one of the main topics that come moving forward, and we're building tech around it. That's one of the main things regarding IDFA. As I said, on the Android side, it's not so important for us because uh, the the application of GAD will come later on, but it's not just now here. So on the IDFA, particularly on the monetization, is the cross-promotion. And we see that uh, most of the uh, uh, publishers and also advertisers are looking for that, okay? And yeah, that's the gravity that, that is mostly affecting us on this on this side. Of course, there's the media mix modeling, creative, and since we are also serving creatives, uh, creative crawlers and things like that, like uh, let's call it, that, that's becoming more important as well. And how do we actually help improve the creative production or the creative serving of the ads and this kind of thing? That's becoming also very relevant in this whole new RDFA changes. I think that's very cool. We have this uh, LTV calculator uh, on our own mm -hmm. dashboard that is, of course, made from all the ECPMs on different placements, et cetera, et cetera. And we talked about the organic factor being something you can just add onto the whole calculation, right? That you don't pay for. And kind of, as I would, of course, with cross promotion, then you don't show another ad. We kind of talk about the same at it being very important, right? Because uh, you can just multiply your whole um, portfolio, as you say. I think that's uh, uh, and with the And with the IDFB moving forward, there will be chances that you can actually build your, uh, grow your, your users, right? And mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to, uh, I mean, that you actually know a, a bit more about the users using the IDFV, things like that, no? That would, could actually help out, yeah. That's very interesting. What about attention, and uh, You already talked about a little bit about the SCAP network you're looking into, and uh, could you elaborate a little bit about those tools? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so apart from growth full stack, Riley, which you're also aware of, which is like an ETL service that we're trying to work on in this privacy-centric model, uh, we're also working on solutions with SCAD Network. So we have an attribution modeling uh, solution, which essentially would allow um, any developer to measure their campaign performance with the same legacy metrics, like your LTV retention rate, uh, with SCAD Network data. So, uh, so for the for the marketer, for the developer, it, it would not be any different from how traditionally they used to measure their campaigns. So the idea is where we take, we collect SCAD data and also try to connect it with our legacy metrics so that eventually the uh, effectiveness of a campaign is still understood by the same metrics that they used pre-iOS uh, pre, uh, 14. 
So that's one area that we are working on. But also what we're trying to do is we're trying to build some training modules for indie developers and small businesses. So our focus usually is with indie developers and small studios, right? Uh, that's majority of our customers. Um, and usually uh, they are just starting out by, you know, they've just beta launched their game. They've just started to test their campaigns. So obviously they're also learning on how they can effectively run UA campaigns. Um, so we we sort of like build some training modules and use cases as well, where we can sort of help them understand what are the best practices that they can actually follow uh, in this in this new system. So so growth full stack, of course, one part of it is uh, where they can access all of these use cases, these different use cases, uh, and we are constantly building on it. So we'll probably like come up with like as Paul mentioned, like cross promotion techniques, right? Like how is the best way you can actually do cross promotion for your for your apps. So, so these are some of the areas that we're working pretty hard on this this year. It sounds like it would be a good year for developers, twenty twenty two, for sure. Uh, yeah. But maybe we should move a little bit on from the IDFA. Uh, I guess some people are also tired of hearing about it, right? And Phil, it was a very big thing in the twenty twenty one. But what were other big marketing trends uh, in twenty twenty one? Maybe Chloe, we can start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, the biggest trend that we we see on our side from last year was uh, there's definitely more brand budget uh, for gaming in, uh, inventory. Um, I don't want to thank for the pandemic, but I think that's definitely one of the reasons that uh, brands suddenly realize, oh, okay, you know, we need to focus. Well, we they finally get to understand, okay, gaming, the, play, the players are the real people, like those people who read Vogue magazine. Because um, mm -hmm. from my background, being trying so hard to tell agencies and brand advertisers, they are the same people, the same audience. <laughs> um, there's always some misunderstanding, you know, towards gaming inventory. Um, it's really interesting. But I think since last year, we definitely see that. And they want to understand, you know, how to buy uh, gaming inventory, uh, no matter what kind of formats. And they actually have like different creatives for, for gaming inventory as well. Not just like one, the same set of creatives and then they just use it in, in, in games. That's definitely a very, very interesting trend that we see from last year. It's very interesting. Uh, what about you, uh, Manu? Do you, is uh, which kind of trends did you kind of see uh, were the biggest one in twenty twenty one? I think I can uh, share two things that that caught my eye. Um, mm -hmm. One was just kind of the increased pace of M and A. I think that really speaks to the fact that reacquisition and cross promotion, like Pao and Anurag were talking about, I mean that's becoming a critical strategy uh, for the future. Um, so continue to watch that very carefully. But then the other thing that appeals a little bit more to the sort of geek side of me was a common thread that I'm seeing across uh, many of the leading studios and publishers. There's this new battleground and warfare sort of emerging around highly sophisticated application of data science to run experiments. Right? I mean, in an industry like this, where margins can be thin and pennies matter, um, you know, these, the, the application of the appropriate data science can really make a huge difference. And so I've seen both the um, level of talent that's being sought and the teams that are being built, um, particularly around UA, but also around monetization. I mean, it's of a caliber you just didn't used to see two years ago. And I still think there's a lot of opportunity um, to continue to improve that. And I think IDFA in a way, you know, um, it's kind of spurring a lot of that. So innovation is being fueled by by that necessity. I think that's some very great insight, and I agree. Kind of sets the border higher, right? Uh, right. Or, or you need to, right? Um, what about at Fiber, uh, Pau? Uh, what do you think are the? Uh, what did you see as some of the biggest trends uh, last year? Yeah, there will be several, but just to mention a few. Yeah. Uh, first, as, as Chloe mentioned, we see brands, brands coming in. We see omni-channel DSPs having a seat at the table, let's say, and being able to bid, let's say, for rewarded and formats that are, before they were like gaming exclusive, let's say, you know. And we are seeing that that is a trend, and that's good, actually, the, to have more competition. And then what Manu mentioned, the consolidation in the industry, that's huge. 
And I think that's what's going to drive everything that's going to happen in the next couple of years. An example is us. We were bought by Digital Turbine. We are making a network, supply, demand, all combined. Not making games, that's a big difference, right? So we see that that has a huge impact on, on gaming companies in particular, because if you think about it, you have the UA, you have the monetization, you have the game development, right? Those three elements. And choosing your right partners who you're going to partner with is going to be fundamental down the road, because uh, they all three getting very close together, and they're, it could be like a domino effect. You know, one of them, if you get too tight with a partner, and all of a sudden, on the UA side of things, that if you if you have a bad experience or whatever, it could have a domino effect on your monetization or even your game development. Because as we know, there are some partners out there who are also making games. So this whole mix of consolidation will bring a lot of challenges for a lot of people. But it's also, I, I think it's, it's normal in any industry, in any capitalistic industry, this is normal to happen. And it's just happening here. And as we see in the gaming industry, it's, he is crazy. What is the last year, 12 months for? And let's see what happens this year. Because I thought I mean, what we, we recently had a huge one, but God knows what's going to happen down. And yeah, that consolidation, I, I'm, together with the whole new paradigm, I think there's going to be new winners and new losers. Okay, And that's what's going to happen. Yeah. I definitely agree. Yeah, yeah, it was fun with the Sinker, right? I mean, thought this is going to be the year's biggest uh, ecosystem. Instance. Then uh, with Blizzard and Microsoft, uh, and maybe Nintendo now, now does something. Who knows? You know, okay. um, like, like I mean, like it could be anything. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. What about uh, you, Anurag? Uh, what do you see as some of the biggest trends? Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> From from our perspective, what we saw, like 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 as everybody said, we did see a, a shift in the spend from iOS to Android, and I think that was also expected because because of the changes, right? Because of the privacy changes, so that was sort of expected. Uh, but I do agree with the whole consolidation aspect of it, which is um, like because of this consolidation factor coming in, like we see a lot of companies combining marketing analytics with product analytics, and the whole idea of why they're doing it is because they have now access to so much of data that they have. So they can build data science models more effectively. Um, so I, that's that's a, that's a trend definitely that has picked up over the last year, and I do see that this that will continue to happen uh, through this year as well. Um, but also in terms of uh, like going back to SCAD network, I think we're pretty hopeful that it will pick up this year. So we will see obviously that spend that was gone gone towards Android probably come back a little towards iOS, uh, not as much as it did. Uh, pre iOS 14, of course, but uh, hopefully it'll like be uh, back more substantially. Um, so that's what we uh, hope, like expecting to see. I would say this year uh, in terms of uh, like some trends, and also I think uh, in terms of like the growing markets. I think Brazil, India, these are markets that are like growing pretty pretty rapidly, and like the number of uh, small studios and indie developers now that are coming out of India is a lot. Um, so uh, I I constantly talk to them on a very regular basis. And um, many of them are now very excited and inquisitive to sort of like start testing their games and really understand what UA is. You know, they want to know how can I have a better retention rate? Uh, how can I have more users for my games? So I think that's another trend I feel uh, is going to happen, um, which is these emerging markets are going to pick up uh, pretty rapidly, I would say. I would hope so as well, because there can be this gap right between a publisher and a developer in at least that we saw in the early hyper casual markets where the developer doesn't have much understanding of what actually happens in the machine, right? Um, but this like in a, in a very innovative ways, uh, do you think it will continue in the, in the next year? And, uh, and and what could we put? Maybe maybe we could start with you because you said you also uh, were a little bit in the whole NFT uh, metaverse uh, blockchain. Is, is that something you think we'll see more of here in, uh, in, in the new year? Is that one of the trends? I, I hope so. I think it's one of the things I'm, you know, in addition to the, uh, the increased uh, capabilities on the data science side, but the, from a player perspective and just having fun and playing these games, I, I think that um, the mashup of play to earn uh, with hyper casual uh, that has a lot of potential. I'm seeing some people already making um, meaningful inroads into that. In fact, at Snapper, our largest client is the biggest blockchain game in the world right now called Splinterlands. Um, and we've just seen them go through the roof from a small shop to a massive $100 million plus dollar studio in 
less than six months. Um, you know, and it's if you think about it, it's it's kind of just mind boggling that as someone who's been in real money gaming, you just think about the math for a second that, you know, someone pays money that they, they place a bet to play your game and then they try to win some money that the money that you pay out counts against your revenues, right? Now, all of a sudden, you can basically print up money because what you're giving them is a form of crypto. So it's not hitting your balance sheet anymore. It's, it's free prizes. Um, it's not as easily said as done. Uh, there's a lot of economics in that game design and the game economy and the crypto economy on how to make that work. But it's fascinating, I think, for players that, hey, while I play, I can win something of monetary value. Um, it's a major motivating factor. And, you know, it also sidesteps all the complex regulatory issues, right? One of the things with any kind of real money gaming has always been, uh, what are the laws that apply to it? Um, but here you're not gambling, that there's no gambling involved, right? There's no, you're not risking anything. So, so I think it just has opened up this entire new thing and it's, it's going to um, definitely mash up with, with uh, hyper casual as, as well as casual and, and maybe even moving up the chain as well. So I'm excited about that. I'm, I'm you know, looking very closely at that space. Me too, actually. I think it, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, as you say, fascinating, right? But we'll, we already start, we also started looking a little bit into it. And the whole tokenomic structure is uh, very fascinating if, if you really love games in general. Because, uh, yeah, I, I think some of the games I used to play a lot was those like uh, farm world kind of games you had on Facebook. Where, where also, I made my own Excel sheets in high school. Uh, to like figure out which crops to uh, to seed at which point, right? And to make the most money and stuff. And so I can definitely see the fascination of the whole uh, actually making real money of it, right? Um, I, I love hearing that. <laughs> and you are uh, one is a nerd, right? Uh, for sure. Uh, <laughs> what about you, Chloe? Which sort of like uh, marketing trends or things do do you think uh, will happen in this year? Well, I said. I guess we have to just mention everything around Web3. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like everything, <laughs> NFTs, you just mentioned blockchain, games, etc. Uh, we actually did our first NFT drops uh, in November last year. Uh, we sold 15 uh, virtual billboards um, in Somian Place. That was really cool. We drove like over 100F and... We just we were so pleased to see that because you know we've been buying digital items, um, but then for many many people, Web three still sounds like a new thing. But um, it's not like from our perspective. So, and also I think the um, this year it's gonna be uh, there's gonna be a lot of like solutions uh, focusing on like. Uh, creator experiences, user, user experiences. So we're gonna move towards like like peer to peer uh, transactions. I don't know how we're gonna shape that as a whole industry, um, but definitely something you know regarding that. And um, NFT, yeah, it's so hot. I bought my um, in January. Uh, price has gone up, yeah, but I'm not gonna sell that anyway. <laughs> But we will see. I hope my one doesn't vanish. <laughs> I totally feel. We looked into the, the at Coinbase, looked at a different one, and we saw the Solana was down. So uh, my, one of my co-founders, he bought for $200, and he already made $20. Uh, so <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm going to go into it as well a little bit, uh, for sure. I don't know uh, what projects you buy, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard there should be some good Discord groups to uh, <laughs> to, to oh, figure yeah. out. There is, there is. I'll share with you later after the call. Good. Good. <laughs> what about at Fiber Power? Is uh, what do you see at the trends? And I, I guess we cannot get around like also asking whether you think NFT or and the whole Web three will uh, will that affect Fiber in any way? Um, I'll get first with the with the trend in twenty twenty two. Okay. Uh, well, I think uh, multivariate creative testing and analytics, AI into creative is going to be a big thing, I hope. Uh, we are seeing also companies that are helping develop uh, advertisers to actually 
uh, maneuver all that. It's a, it's a pretty thrilling world, especially not just the, the creative creation, but the creative rendering. That's also a big piece, and we'll see how that plays out. And we are actually um, working on that, no? on how to help the best possible the rendering of the creatives, which we, which uh, sometimes is not that important for advertisers, but it plays a key element into how the performance of the campaigns are. Okay, and it's normally a bit overlooked, and we think that that's going to be more present. And we also see different networks, DSPs, working a lot around this. So that would be one. Uh, and regarding NFTs, I'm not very familiar with the topic. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I am a gamer. I'm a very, very big gamer. Okay, I, I even yeah. used to compete professionally many years ago, and I am very much into this. And I think that uh, the NFTs is still something that has to be proven. Okay, I don't. I think it's too new. It's too early to talk to to like say, hey, this is gonna crack it or not. I'm sorry, Manu, but that is my opinion. And I think that there's a bit of controversy between the 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 gamers. I don't know if the yeah. gamers have the same feelings as the developers. And there, there will be some sort of an, an alignment there, no? And but this is more a personal opinion, <laughs> and we'll see how this ends up. Uh, but I, I do believe that we are creating art with gaming. Gaming is a, is an artistic product, just like with filmmaking or music. And is the the center of this thing is the user, is the person who enjoys this piece of art, who is playing this game and enjoys it. I think play to earn is really good. That's really important, and I think that has a lot of future. We see it in the budgets. We see a lot of um, companies who are into play to earn. They have huge buys and they are doing very well. So I think that side it really has a lot of future, in my opinion. But the NFTs, I don't know. Um, I think it's, for my opinion, it's too early to say. Yeah, it is very interesting how it will go out, right? I also wonder whether the whole NFT blockchain web free also, because we research it a lot lately, and it seems like it also opens up for a group of people who don't. They do play games, but but maybe it's more the making money they're interested in, but right. doing it exactly. in in a product that they already love. At least that that's the way some of them explain it to me. And they're like, yeah, I guess that makes sense. If you don't understand much about art, you don't want to invest in art just right. You rather want to invest in something inside of a game because also that seems more sustainable. Uh, but but it, yeah yeah, who knows, right? Uh, maybe if we have a, a catch up next year, <laughs> we can see how it. <laughs> how it played out. Uh, what right. about, uh, just add one thing on that, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, just uh, was listening to Pao's comment there, that uh, there, there is a difference. It's not always clear because this terminology and in, in the media gets, you know, just kind of bandied about, but between NFT gaming and play to earn, right? Um, yeah, I think forever people are going to want to win something of monetary value. Right? That, that's just a, um, something that'll never go away. And this provides a new game mechanic and a, a, a game economy mechanic to achieve that. NFT gaming is definitely much more experimental. And you know, I, I think you know, the, the jury is more out on that one. Um, so I just wanted to kind of add that, that additional point. I think that's a good point. Yeah, that's like a difference, right? Uh, it's a big yeah. difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What about uh, Anorak at attention? Uh, unless, of course, anyone else have any more comments on the whole. Uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna get back to it again uh, a little later. Uh, but then, otherwise, Anorak, what about? Uh, yeah, I guess now we kind of dueled it, right? Trends for uh, 2022 uh, and your thoughts on the whole uh, play to earn web free NFTs. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think one thing also, like what Chloe said, um, like innovation in terms of monetization is like pretty interesting for me as well, because now with like uh, what AdMix also does, like you're trying to like uh, get your ads in, a, in into the narrative of the game itself where it is non-intrusive. So you've seen uh, like audio ads sort of pick, pick up as well, right? Like where it is becoming non-intrusive so that your retention rates are pretty high. Um, so of course that is like, I feel like there is more innovation and stuff happening in that space. Uh, but coming back to the whole NFT thing, uh, I do agree. Like I think I'm more on the power side, which is uh, I personally am not really um, like too aware of it, but I do think that we are all in the exploratory phase at this point. Um, it is too soon for anyone to really say if it's going to work or not. 
But one thing is for sure that what we see is a lot of big game studios are moving towards that, right? Like they're moving towards play to one. They are experimenting it with with their games, right? So we've seen like Voodoo and many other big publishers are really looking into this more carefully. So what what we're trying to do is we're trying to like get more information and research this topic as well to see that how like since we are an attribution provider, we want to see how attribution would really fit into this new into this new business model, right? So so we are also like at this point really experimenting or exploring this this area more uh, effectively. Uh, but I think one thing I would say is that what what is more crucial would be like how Apple and Google really react because I think right now uh, on their platform uh, they don't allow third party payment systems right like uh, they don't incorporate any blockchain technology so so it'll be more uh, interesting to see how they react over this year in terms of NFT and crypto games um, and I guess that's how the whole industry will work based on how they would do it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think, uh, and and what Manu also said that the difference between the NFTs as a, yeah, as they are and the the play to earn, uh, probably that's because at least a positive thing we talked about with play to earn, uh, Manu. I'm not sure whether you know more about, it, but could it potentially uh, be the one that like kind of sponsors multiplayer, uh, real multiplayer in different hyper casual games? Because at least with some of our games, we have looked into like the server costs. But sometimes if your margin is not so uh, so big between what it costs you to acquire the player and, and what you make of them, then the server space might actually be too expensive. So your margin becomes so small. Do you think that that uh, like the whole play to earn can open up for more multiplayer uh, experiences? I, I think so. I think because the potential to win, you know, things of monetary value will drive up LTV and also attract new users uh, that can, you know, provide enough margin to cover these extra backend costs. You know, let's take as an example, this game splinterlands.com. It's, um, it's a fantasy card based battling game, right? You, you know, you, you purchase a pack of 10 cards. I purchase a pack of 10 cards. We get random cards. I assemble my fantasy team, you assemble your fantasy team, and then we battle. So, so far I've spent $10 on my, my pack. Um, if you win the battle, your team wins the battle against mine, you are winning the in-game token. In, in that particular game, it's called Dark Energy Crystals. Um, Dark Energy Crystals has now real monetary value. You can go on to Bittrex and other exchanges and actually sell them for Bitcoin and eventually convert it to USD or other currencies um, if you want. And so players are actively buying these card packs because they, they want to find those more and more rare cards that are within there to give them a chance to win more battles, to give them a chance to earn more money, right? So it's a very compelling mechanic. It's a lot of fun for players. Um, it's driving explosive growth. Um, and, you know, the costs of things like server and all that, they, they become a, sort of a non-issue. They, they become, you know, very affordable uh, at that point. And so, so that's what I, that's why I, I, you know, it's coming across that I'm so excited about this because it's just this whole new opportunity to entertain players. I must say, I, yeah, I, I kind of I do hear a lot of the whole what Pau and Anurag also said um, from some of the more, yeah, from the more gamer side, right? Being a little bit worried about the NFT side. Uh, who think the whole play to earn is, yeah, very interesting and create some new opportunities. Uh, maybe this could be a question for the for Anurag and Pau as well. How do you think about that? Because if I understand with play to earn and these blockchain web free uh, metaverse games, a lot of the whole um, acquiring users, if you could call it that, actually comes organically through creating a community and having more what I would say classic marketing, like in the Dropbox days. That's what was when I went to university. It was just like you got a very small amount of data, so you needed to tell a ton of friends to also download Dropbox to get data enough to afford actually to work right. Do you, I, I, do you guys fear, how do you think it will affect the whole UA scene that marketing in the new world might switch more over to organic marketing? If it's uh, not too big of a question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'll actually let Pao answer this in more detail, but from my uh, perspective, I, I, I honestly, I would say, I, I don't know how it would affect at this point because um, like, like understanding UA itself has changed geographically like every region is responding very differently right like 
for example let's take india india is still under like the ua mechanics of india is still not as mature probably as how it is in japan or the us so i i wouldn't really know how this play to earn model would really change the ua world in that sense um but but from from our perspective what we do know is we we keep a close watch on all of these changes only because at the end of it what we really want to deliver to the customer is that they should have like better ltv and retention rates for their for their users right that's that's the final outcome that we're looking for 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 our customers so however it really affects we would start eventually working with them getting the feedback to build something for them that actually gives them that outcome that they're really looking for so i would say uh, i wouldn't really be able to give like uh, any like trends in terms of like how the ua would change so um i guess power would be the best one to answer this <laughs> <laughs> i'll try i'll try but i cannot promise anything <laughs> uh, yeah I, i the way i see the nfts is just another monetization aspect that the mm-hmm. that the games can actually do no they can earn more money by offering this and it can enhance the experience of the players that's how i see it okay mm-hmm. but Uh, I don't think that's going to counterweight the fact that, first of all, the App Store is tremendously big, okay? So in order to, you need you need UA in order to run uh, apps. In order to, it's not that UA is something, it's a commodity that you can put on top and get some more users. Maybe in the hyper-casual genre, you have that games have like 90% organic or something. But in the majority of the other titles, UA is needed not just to bring plays, but to develop the app. That's why you have all these soft launches, tech soft launches, three soft launches, take one year, the, the, the soft launch. That is because marketing, in fact, is, is counted as, as development costs. A lot of companies do that. They don't even put it as a marketing cost. It's development cost because they need UA in order to grow, develop their products. And I don't think that's going to change. If there's a new monetization feature inside the game, which is the NFTs, you name it, That's not going to change the fact that in order to make your game, because at the, at the end, it's only going to enhance the experience, but you need to build that experience. So you need to first build a game that makes sense, that is fun, and then you can put all those NFTs, whatever you want, to make it much cooler. But you need to have something, a core loop. You need to have something. And in order to build that, unfortunately, you need UA. This is how the market works. So I don't think UA is going anywhere. It's just going to stay, <laughs> and it will be more and more powerful and That's that's my take. UA is here to stay, and it just developers need it. It's not a it's not something that they can just opt in. Uh, I think that's a very it. good point about the launches. The launches that you need, yeah, players in uh, at a specific rate <laughs> or, or amount, right, to kind of test the things you want. Uh, and uh, just even this like like um, this coin game, which is basically based on Facebook friends, and if you don't have enough organic uplift and this K factor from your friends, even in those games, you need a heavy, very UA, okay? Mm-hmm. So UA is always in. So we already have examples in which games that actually you need friends to be playing with each other or very alike people, like these coin games in which they, you compete against your friends, you actually need UA in those as well. So that would be an example of how I don't, I, don't, I think that it's, it will be still ne- uh, necessary. Yeah, so maybe the magic will even be in mixing it, right? Taking the best from both worlds and uh, yeah. doing that. Uh, what about you, Chloe, at AppMix? Do you have any... Um, t- do do you think the whole uh, crypto world will affect uh, the... I mean, it sounded like it already did. You started doing uh, ads inside of uh, Metaverse, uh, play-to-earn games as well. Could you elaborate a little on that? Yeah, um, this is actually our um, 2022 focus as, as a business um, because we wanna, we wanna we wanna be one of the first uh, to be able to do that, be part of the journey. Um, what we see it is um, the 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 point of you know the whole metaverse thing is to have everything decentralized. So because everything's very centralized right now, like we've got like one main social media platforms, um, a few couple of like gaming companies, etc., and two main play stores, blah, blah. Um, but we, in our um, in our heads, our vision is everything's going to be decentralized. For, for example, for hyper casual games, if a player really, really loves one specific avatar, they can buy it, own it, and then put it into another game And then play that game 
So that's our vision. Like you, they can just carry different digital items to different games. Um, and then, for example, like for hyper casual studios, you may be able to charge them like a dollar or two if they want to use ever their own avatars, not your not your own ones. So that's how we how we see it. And we don't know how long it's going to take us from here to there. Yeah, but I, we believe that's going to happen. But better be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's very interesting. We looked at, <laughs> yeah, we also we looked at the prices for some of those NFTs. It might also be a bubble and a and a thing right now, right? But it's like it's like a minimum hundred US dollars. And in a hyper yeah. casual game, it's very hard to get someone to use hundred US dollars. Especially on buying one thing, right? So it's uh, for, for in that regard, I think it's very interesting. Uh, I think as we talk about, uh, feel about wrapping up, uh, so I thought a, a very cool last question could be: if you could mention marketing uh, marketing trend, people should uh, like keep the eye on in 2022. What would it be? Um, and maybe Anurag, should we uh, start with you? Um... Yeah, so I think one I would say is play to one. Like even though I personally wouldn't really understand it, but I, from what we see, one if I had to pick one, it has to be play to one and uh, crypto games because like big publishers are really like being serious about this, right? So uh, I would say that that would be my my one pick. I would say this year that uh, people should be uh, looking out for. And what about you, Paul? Hey, I'll I'll mention something different. <laughs> so so moving forward with the whole IDFA issue that we have, that creative is king and creative is going to be fundamental in our strategies. I would say what I mentioned earlier, rendering. I yeah. think that uh, that's a huge element that has been overlooked, and I think that more and more advertisers, uh, DSPs are are realizing that. And more and more advertisers are going to put more focus into that because they spend so much. I mean, if you look at gaming companies, there's basically two companies. One is the UA stuff. Another was the creative studio that's making the, all, the, all the content to run in the UA. You know, that's huge. It's so much money that you're spending on that. And at the end, it's like you run, you create a video, you run it. But the way that video is going to be shown can be extremely different from one SDK to another. And owning that piece that right now is owned by the networks or by the yeah by the SDKs, and there's a workaround around it. If you run an M raid, let's say, and on a, on a rewarded placement or whatever, you can run a video instead of a playable, and then you can apply your own rendering. Okay, so that I think more and more people are going to be aware of this. I would say, why do I have to actually run with this rendering from this? Because when you run a creative video, you will see different metrics across different SDKs with the, with the same video. You're like, what's going on here? Well, that's because the rendering is different, okay? So the moment you own that piece, and that is the, the next step that I think is going to be coming into the core creative world, which is uh, if you look at EUA Manage, they spend 60%, 70% of their time on creatives. So they have to own this part, and this, I think, is going to be very important in 2022, I, I hope, or but definitely at some point has to come, yeah. That's very interesting. Very, uh, yeah. Uh, what about you, Chloe? Um, I would say like either Web 2 or Web 3 or not, um, there's definitely going to be more brand um, money coming into uh, gaming. So what they care about is, uh, you know, non-intrusive experiences. And I think from um, studios point of view, how to create that kind of experiences that brands want their um, users to see, how they want to drive you know, run a brand campaign, I think that would be something uh, both publishers and advertisers can work uh, together in 2022. It's very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, it will be interesting to see what happens in general, right? Well, Manu, yeah. Yeah, we will have you as the, the last one giving your insights on uh, what to keep an eye on in 2022. Yeah, I think, you know, is what, what I think uh, is kind of the biggest trend is really just, if you look at the budgets overall, there's the development budget, there's the UA budget. Up until recently, the, the, the portion of the budget that's allocated towards loyalty, driving engagement, um, hasn't been sufficient. And I'm starting to see that change and I expect that to continue to change. And I think 
IDFA and other factors are just going to grow that. And people who are modeling this out are realizing that, hey, driving loyalty and engagement, it doesn't just improve retention and therefore um, LTV, but loyalty actually generates UA as well. So, so it's a form of UA effectively. Um, so I see the, the, the reallocation of some budgets going from traditional UA to loyalty and engagement you know, as, as we move forward. Very interesting. All right, I think that was some great insights for everyone. Uh, uh, I personally hope all of them uh, will kind of happen. Uh, I think we'll just say bye here, uh, if I understood it correctly. Uh, and thanks a lot for being part of this panel. It was very interesting. I, I learned a lot from it. Uh, so thanks a lot, guys. Thank and you, Ryan. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. See you. Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye. -bye.